Hi everyone, this video is part two of the 1B section of the Biological Basis of Behavior unit. This particular video focuses on the foundations of sensation. So as you can see on the unit one outline, this video falls within the topic called 1.6 sensation. We're nearing the end of the content in unit one, but this video is just the start of the topic on sensation, where there will be several videos related to the sensory systems. These are the key focus questions of today's video. They will cover the main themes of our topic for today. If you'd like to take a second and pause the video to read through them, this will give us the premise for what we will cover today. Next are our vocabulary words. These are the essential concepts that will be covered in this particular video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as you can see, the title of this slide is Sensation versus Perception. And today's video is only focusing on sensation. Perception is actually going to occur in Unit 2, but since these topics are directly linked to one another, I wanted to start by defining each of them and then explaining why they're in separate units. Sensation is the process by which our sensory receptors in our nervous system pick up or detect information in our environment. And perception is the process by which our brain interprets organizes and processes all of that sensory information. Now these two topics are linked together, but for our course outline, they're separated. The college board places sensation in unit one because it's related to how our nervous system picks up information in our environment. And our second unit is about cognition, which is how the mind processes information. Things like thinking, problem solving, creativity, memory, intelligence, and perception. So since perception is more of a function of the mind, the college board has placed it in unit two. It will actually be the first topic that we start with after completing unit one, so it won't be as disjointed as it might seem right now. So the rest of today's video will focus on laying the groundwork of sensation, and I'm calling this video Foundations of Sensation because we will go through some of the basic topics that are related to sensation in general, like how our senses detect information, when they notice a change in a stimulus and how our senses interact with one another. And then in the next few videos, I'll focus very specifically on the different types of senses. So now let's talk about the types of sensory receptors. Because you've already learned about the nervous system, you already know about the passage of information from sensory neurons to interneurons and back out to motor neurons. So I'll start with the receptors that are at the very beginning of this process. On the screen, you can see visual representations of the different types of sensory receptors that detect information outside of our body. We have photoreceptors that are located in the retinas of our eyes, and these detect light. You can see that they're labeled rods and cones. We also have tiny cilia cells that are inside of our cochleas, which are in our ears, and these are tiny sensory receptors that detect sound. We also have really small sensory receptors in our nose that detect the chemicals that help us smell. We have small papillae on our tongue that detect the chemicals that help us taste. And then we have a variety of uh, sensory receptors in our skin that help us detect different types of touch, like pain or pressure or temperature. And as I mentioned in the earlier in this video, we're going to focus on sensation in general today, but I will go into more depth about the process of each of these sensations in the coming videos. So our sensory receptors in our skin, our nose, our eyes, our ears, they detect stimuli in the environment. But at what point can our sensory receptors not detect something? Our senses allow us to detect all kinds of things in our environment, but we can't hear everything in our environment. We can't smell all of the odors in our vicinity. So at what point are my ears no longer picking up a sound? Or at what point is a scent too faint to pick up. This is referred to as a threshold and specifically the absolute threshold, which can be defined as the point at which I can detect a st stimulus with 50% accuracy. Anything beyond that is considered outside of my threshold for detection. Or in other words, the absolute threshold is the minimum amount of a stimulus necessary to detect it 50% of the time. So the absolute threshold is the edge of our awareness of a stimuli in our environment. This concept of absolute threshold marks the point at which a stimulus goes from undetectable to detectable by our senses, and it highlights the minimum intensity that's required to perceive a sensation. Everyone's absolute threshold is different, but it's believed for the average person in a completely controlled 
an unobscured environment that the absolute threshold for detecting a light in the darkness is 30 miles away. 30 miles. The faintest sound the average human can detect when an, in an unobscured controlled environment is the ticking of a watch from about 20 feet away in a completely silent environment. And the lightest touch that can be felt on the skin is believed to be about the, the wing, the weight of a wing of a bee falling onto your cheek from the height of about one centimeter. Anything outside of that, fainter than that, or farther away would not be able to be detected 50% of the time. To function effectively, we don't need to be able to detect everything in our environments accurately. We just need an absolute threshold low enough that allows us to detect important signals um, of taste, textures, and smells. And we need to be able to detect differences in our stimuli as well. So this brings us to our ability to detect that a stimulus has changed its intensity. For example, if a musician is tuning an instrument, they would need to be able to detect the change in the sound to identify the point at which they are on the correct note. The point where we can notice when a stimulus has changed is referred to as the just noticeable difference or the difference threshold. More formally, this is defined as the minimum difference needed to detect the change correctly 50% of the time. So in other words, the just noticeable difference is the smallest difference in the intensity of a stimulus that a person can detect. It's the point at which you notice the stimulus has changed in its intensity. So here's an example. Imagine you're sitting in warm bath water. Gradually, as you sit in the bath, the water will start to cool. The difference threshold is the point at which you notice that the water is getting cooler. For instance, if the water temperature drops by one degree Fahrenheit, you might not notice it. But once it drops by, say, three degrees, then you probably are aware that the bath water is getting cooler. Or an example given by the textbook is when font size slowly changes. Notice on the screen there's a copy of the 23rd Psalm and it's printed and in gradually increasing font size. You might not notice at first that the font size is changing, but as you read line after line, the point at which it becomes evident that the font size is larger is your just noticeable difference. So as we're learning about detecting when a stimulus has changed, it's important that we know Weber's law. Weber's law was concluded by a German physician named Ernst Weber, and he concluded that in order to detect a change in a stimulus, it must change by a constant minimum percentage relative to its initial intensity. So if the change is less than that minimum percentage, we're likely not to notice it. The exact percentage varies depending on the stimulus. For example, with light, the change must be at least 8% for you to notice that the light has gotten dimmer or brighter. For weight, the change must be at least 2% for you to perceive that it's gotten heavier or lighter. In practice, what this means is that larger changes in a stimulus are more likely to be detected, as the required percentage for noticing a change is consistent relative to the initial intensity of the stimulus. So Weber's law is all about how we notice change in things around us, and it says that in order to notice that a stimulus has changed, like light getting brighter or dimmer, or a weight getting heavier or lighter, the change has to be big enough compared to what you started with. For example, if a light gets dimmer by a little bit, you might not notice it. But if it gets dimmer by a lot, you will likely notice it. So now let's talk about when we have diminished sensitivity to a stimulus in our environment. This is called sensory adaptation. Sensory adaptation is a process where our sensory receptors become less sensitive to constant stimuli over time. This means that if you're exposed to a certain stimulus for a prolonged period, your senses will start to ignore it. This process helps our brain focus on new and changing stimuli in our environment, which might be important for our survival and attention.
The Febreze Nose Blind campaign is a great example of sensory adaptation. Their campaign actually tries to teach its potential buyers about their susceptibility to sensory adaptation by telling them that they may become nose blind to the odors in their own homes. So when you first walk into a room with a strong smell, you immediately notice it because it's new to your senses. But if you stay in that room for a while, your sense of smell starts to adapt and the receptors in your nose send fewer signals to your brain about the odor because it's constant and it's unchanging. And eventually you stop noticing the smell altogether. This is sensory adaptation in action. Your brain has decided that the constant smell is not important enough to keep paying attention to. So the Febreze campaign plays on this concept by showing you that you might not notice the smells in your own home because of sensory adaptation. So the important takeaway here is that sensory adaptation is your brain's way of tuning out constant unchanging stimuli so that it can focus on new and important information. Now you might be wondering, does sensory adaptation apply to all of our senses? Because why then if we stare at an object that's not moving, does the object not just vanish away from our vision because we've gotten used to it? Well, the answer is because visual information entering our eyes is actually constantly moving and changing because our eyes are always moving, changing the stimuli that's entering our eyes. So if you look at the image on the screen, this came from a 2007 study. This shows a diagram that was created from an eye tracking recorder. The study participant was given this photograph of Prince's Street Gardens and told to look at the image. The device recorded all of the movements of the eye. The dots represent places that the eye stopped and the numbers indicate the time of fixation in milliseconds. So for reference, 300 milliseconds is three tenths of a second. So even though the visual itself did not change, the participants' eyes were constantly changing the visual images that were entering the brain because of the rapid adjustment of their eyes. So this still doesn't quite answer our question about sensory adaptation and vision, but what if the visual image was kept constant and the eye was kept still, would sensory adaptation occur? Would the visual images eventually vanish like odors do? So to find out the answer to this question, psychologists devised instruments that maintain a constant image into the eye's inner surface. In the illustration on the screen, you can see there is a volunteer that is wearing an instrument that has a small projector mounted on a contact lens. When the participant's eye moves, the projector moves as well, ensuring that the image projected onto the back of the eye is never changing. The diagram labeled B shows what happens over time. The participant is given images of a face, a triangle, the capital letters H and B put together, and the word beer, B-E-E-R. Over time, and constant exposure, participants report seeing the image of the face start to disappear and reappear, and in other places, only fragments of the initial image. So sensory adaptation occurs with any stimulus, a sound, a touch to the skin, taste, smell, or even a visual image will eventually start to diminish over time if there is constant, unchanging exposure. We become less sensitive to it because our brain's decision is to avert our attention elsewhere. So now let's discuss how our senses can interact and influence one another. Sensory interaction is the principle that one sense can influence another. Our senses don't work in isolation. They often combine to interact and create our perception of the world. This interaction can actually enhance or even alter our experiences, just making them more complex. A real world example of when our senses work together to influence one another is with taste and smell. When you eat food, you have the sense of taste that's picking up the basic flavors, but at the same time, your sense of smell is picking up the complex aromas of the food. And these two senses work together to give you a complete experience of flavor. For example, when you eat a strawberry, your taste buds detect the sweetness while your nose picks up the specific aroma of that strawberry. If you have a cold and your sense of smell is blocked, food often tastes bland. And this is because the interaction between taste and smell is disrupted, showing how much our perception of flavor actually relies on the interaction between taste and smell. 
Now, also, we have interaction between our vision and our hearing, and you will notice this when you watch a movie or a video, and you'll notice that you have the sound coming through the speakers, and then you see the mouths moving. And these senses combine to give us a more immersive experience. And you might notice that whenever uh, the visuals and the sound don't match up, like in a poorly dubbed movie, it can distract you or become really jarring because this shows how our brain is expecting to utilize both the sound and the vision to make sense of what we're experiencing. Synesthesia is a fascinating condition where sensations are interacting with one another. This condition occurs when an individual has stimulated one sensation and it leads to the involuntary experience of another. And this is a cross wiring in neural connections that creates a really unique experience for the individual. Common forms of synesthesia include when seeing or reading letters or numbers causes the perception of a color or where where particular sounds evoke visual colors, or where words or sounds trigger specific tastes. And these sensory experiences are vivid and consistent over time, suggesting that there is a neurological basis for this connectivity that has somehow connected sensory regions of the brain. It's estimated that about 4% of the population experiences some form of synesthesia, and this prevalence suggests that while synesthesia is relatively rare, it's not exceptionally uncommon and many people might have mild forms of it without even realizing it. So as we finish out today's video, I will read a few multiple choice questions to you for review. Make sure to pause the video after the question to determine the answer. Question number one says, Natalia is washing her hands and she adjusts the faucet handle until the water feels just slightly hotter than it did before. This is an example of Question number two says, Taishane went swimming with friends who did not want to get into the pool because the water felt too cold. Taishane jumped in and after a few minutes declared, come on in. Taishane's body became accustomed to the water temperature due to. Number three says, which of the following is the best example of sensory interaction? This concludes part two, the foundations of sensation. Be sure to check the answers to the multiple choice questions below. And before closing out, check that you can answer our key focus questions and define our essential concepts.